Radio, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the very first arts dinner live and online. Um, we are coming to you tonight from the Empire Theatre in Toowoomba. Um, I would like to introduce Adrian Bowens, who is the traditional custodian of Gumanguru for our welcome to country. Um, good evening, everyone. I'd just like to start by acknowledging uh, the elders and First Nations people of the past, present and future. I'd also like to uh, thank Michelle for the opportunity to come out here and welcome you all out to country tonight. Gumbadaru Waba, Duraba Waka Waka Duggan. In my language, that means good day all. I'd like to welcome you out onto Waka Waka land. In my native tongue, um, Galang means good. And so I wish you all a uh, Galang night. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so welcome everybody to the first of a series um, of arts dinners live and online, which have been we have been very grateful to have um, funding from Arts Queensland for. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge all the traditional owners of the lands on which we stand and represent and to all those who are listening to this across Australia. So this week is NAIDOC week, whose theme is always was, always will be. And it recognises that First Nations peoples have occupied and cared for this continent for over 65,000 years. Always was, always will be, acknowledges that hundreds of nations and cultures covered this. NAIDOC 2020 invites all Australians to embrace this history. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and honour their stewardship of this land. So my name's Michelle Blair. I'm the Regional Arts Officer for South West Queensland. I'm based here at the Empire Theatre and um, I'm supporting artists and creatives across the South West, which includes Scenic Rim, the Lockyer Valley, Toowoomba, Southern Downs, Western Downs, Gundawindi, Maranoa and Ballon. Also here tonight, I have Bronwyn Davies, who is my co-host for this evening. Um, she is a practicing artist and has been an arts worker for almost 30 years and is also the coordinator of cultural services at Scenic Rim Regional Council. Tonight's program gives us an insight into what might be the career pathways for someone interested in pursuing their passions or interest in the arts. We will be live streaming this panel discussion and urge you watching the live stream at home to post any questions you have for the panel in the chat room and we'll try to get to these in the course of the broadcast. For those in the room, you will have the opportunity after dinner to join us in a speed dating um, session and the art session where you will have 10 minutes with each panelist to ask questions. Um, we will have some sign up sheets sitting outside for you um, to, that you can put your name onto once we actually break for dinner. So tonight, let me introduce our panel members. Tonight we have Naomi Marsh, who is the Collection and Exhibition Officer at Toowoomba Regional Art Gallery. She has a background in collection management, having worked on projects involving researching and cataloguing museum collections for digitisation, as well as assisting with a disaster recovery project for Toowoomba's local history library, following damage from the 2011 floods. Through her current role, Naomi has assisted with the development, curation and installation of numerous exhibitions. Along with the development and streamlining of policies and procedures for the collector management at TRAG. In 2019, Naomi was selected to participate in the Open Palace Program, which involved professional visits to palaces, museums, archives and heritage sites across the UK to engage directly with experts. The program offered a unique perspective on glam and heritage specialisation and practices including conservation, collections management, interpretation, education and visitor experience. We also have Ari Palani with us tonight. Um, he's not only my office mate, he is also um, a, our Youth Arts Director here at the Empire Theatre. He has also recently been appointed the Director for Queensland um, Regional Arts Australia. So Ari is a passionate director, producer, community engagement specialist and theatre maker. He has worked across many communities in Australia, facilitating creative outcomes that advocate for youth voice, accessibility and social cohesion. 
Ari is internationally focused on building cultural econom economies, humanitarian responses, and increasing the discussion around displaced communities. He has worked extensively in South Korea and Malaysia, developing innovative programs, highlighting the interconnectedness of the arts in contemporary STEM education, and translating these into hybrid models of cultural engagement in the vast Australian landscape. In his role, <laughs> Gosh. I'm sorry. Hey, this is your, these are yours. <laughs> so in his role, he has directed outcomes for the Queensland Theatre, Le Bois Theatre Company, QUT, USQ, and, to, and in 2018 was the finalist for the Queensland Multicultural Outstanding Individual Achiever Award. Ari is also currently in his final year as part of the acclaimed Masters of Fine Arts in Cultural Leadership at NIDA. So it's his desire to build the capacity of industries and works to nourish cohesion and promote the joy of collaborative practice in his spare time. <laughs> um, uh, so we also have uh, Dr. Kyle Jenkins here with us this evening. Um, he is the Associate Head of Community Engagement of Outreach Programs Marketing Schools, um, the Coordinator of Visual Arts, Senior Lecturer in Painting and Art Theory, at the School of Creative Arts at USQ here in Toowoomba. He has a PhD from Sydney College of the Arts. Um, his practice is situated when, within aspects of conceptual and non-objective geometric and monochromatic painting, collage, photography, objects, books, wall paintings and works on paper. He has exhibited nationally and internationally since 1996. His work is held in museum and private collections nationally and internationally, and he is represented by Minus Space, New York, Alexandra Lawson Gallery, Toowoomba, and Block Projects in Melbourne. We also have Steve Cooper in the room tonight. Um, Steve recently moved to Toowoomba some three and a half years ago. He was born in Casino and commenced his professional career in Sydney, interrupted by a five year stint in Austria, where he lived his passion for winter sport and business. He has a diverse background in business, tourism, transport, sustainability, and now museums. His professional resume includes uh, the passenger business manager for CountryLink New South Wales, marketing manager for Queensland Rail Travel Train, commercialization manager for the Department of Transport and Works Northern Territory, the marketing manager for the Murray River, the CEO for Tourism Noosa and Sunshine Coast Destination, UNESCO Biosphere Deputy Chairman for five years, and he is now currently the Operations Manager at the Cobb Co Queensland Museum Network and is a member of the Arts Council of Toowoomba. And online tonight, we have got Claire Christian. Claire is a storyteller, a writer, theatre maker and facilitator. She has four, four plays published by Playlab, including Liza and the Freeborn Dames, which debuted at Le Boite in 2018. She has had the great joy of directing Michelle Law's smash hit comedy, Single Asian Female, since 2017. Her debut novel, Beautiful Mess, won the Tex Prize in 2016 and has been translated in multiple different languages. Her first adult fiction novel, It's Been a Pleasure, Noni Blake, came out in October this year. Claire has a pug named Midge, a deep affinity for garlic bread, and she never has boring hair, ever. So welcome everybody. Um, so to start on for this evening, um, I have a question for each of our panel members. What was your pathway to your role in the arts today? How will we do? Who will go first? I think we'll start with Kyle. Yep. Um, well, so my mother's an accountant and she still feels I haven't got a proper job. So um, I started at Sydney Uni in architecture for a year and uh, I couldn't make a model stay up and they transferred me to visual arts. So I never had an interest in visual arts, um, but I had more of an interest in reading and finding out about the world. And uh, look, I think the, I don't know if I'd use the word passion because I, I just look at art as being a job and it's, it's a job that most people need to do for themselves to be creative. Because the idea of being creative is not to, to have exhibitions or, I mean, they're a benefit um, or, you know, to put on theatre productions or do anything like that. The idea is that art becomes, and it doesn't matter what sort of art you do, but art becomes a window 
for finding out your place in the world, but also finding out a sense about yourself. And really, I mean, it doesn't matter how these things work out for you, but for me, uh, art's just something I do every day. And whether that's in the studio making stuff or thinking about it, um, I think that's the value of art. And so I guess you could say that um, I haven't, I haven't really ever thought about art in terms of money. Um, I've always thought about art as a necessity for myself to, I don't know, make me tolerable towards others maybe. Um, but, you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's a really amazing quality to have of being human is the ability to be able to invent something that doesn't yet exist in the world for you. You know, everything has been done in some way, but it hasn't been done by you. And that's for me what, how I came to art and then it's okay. I, I think back to those amazing architectural models that couldn't stand up and I'm glad they couldn't. So. Um, I did a Bachelor of Arts and I majored in history and visual art theory um, and did my honours in, majored in history, but with a, my research was based on an exhibition um, at the Workshops Rail Museum in Ipswich, actually part of the Queensland Museum Network. Um, so, yeah, I went in and into it with a passion for history, but um, it quickly transferred to a passion for arts as well. So, yeah, landed me where I am today. Hi, guys. I'm obviously the odd man out here tonight. Um, my journey started with a discovery of the world. As you, you heard, I uh, lived in Europe and Austria for a couple of years. Um, I was a young guy riding a bike as best I could around Europe and, and surfing wherever I could, but um, the goal was to get the Canary Islands. No money, couldn't make it happen. So I ended up uh, looking for a job in Austria and um, ended up being adopted by a family which put me through business school in Vienna. And uh, it gave me a wonderful insight into the balance of work, recreation, art, and then bringing that sense of accountability back into the workplace and in my future career going forward. Uh, <clears throat> I suppose my story has been kind of forged by lots of different things. My, my parents were refugees from multiple different countries, converged into Germany where they met, moved to uh, Malaysia where they were working and waiting for arrival here into Australia where they had my sister and I Finally, we came to Australia and they wanted a far more stable <laughs> career for me than when I discovered the arts. And I was like, I want to be the first clarinetist for every major uh, orchestra uh, here in Australia. And then I was inspired by my drama teacher at school at Harris Down State High School the wonderful Mr. Tim Reuter. And he uh, uh, inspired me on a path to be like, oh, I think I want to be a drama teacher. I was terrible at education when I got to university and just focused on making theatre. And from there, I was inspired by the great facilitators here in this country, uh, Lenine Burke, um, and decided, okay, this is what I want to do. So... From there, it's been, it, it was quite a traditional journey from school into university. And then after that, it was very swirly crazy, jumping from lots of different gigs in lots of different industries. But I suppose we'll get into that a little bit later. Hope so. That sounds like a very interesting topic to mine. I'm um, going to start with some questions for Naomi. Oh, Claire, sorry, Claire. Jump in ah. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge that here uh, uh, I'm on Yagara and Turrbal country here in Mianjin. That's where I'm coming from you from tonight. I want to pay my respects to elders past and, and emerging. Um, so my past, I grew up on the Gold Coast uh, as a fat theatre loving quirky kid who hated the beach um, with a working class family who had no kind of connection to the arts and so um, I loved drama and I loved theatre and I, I thought that's what I wanted to do but my parents suggested because they had no examples of anyone living making a living from art making um, that teaching was the safest option or the best option because as they would say um, 
you can teach anywhere. If you can teach, you could you could travel. Um, so that's what I did. I went in. I had an amazing drama teacher in high school. Um, and so I was like, yeah, okay, I'll be a teacher. And so that's where my path started. But I'd always written. I wrote my first novel when I was six that we can that we know about <laughs> um, that we have proof of. And so writing was the secret thing that I did that I didn't tell anyone. That was my kind of dream. And then when I was a teacher, I couldn't find a play that I wanted to do um, with my students. And so I thought, oh, I'll write one. And um, that play kind of changed the whole trajectory of my life because I entered it into a competition at Queensland Theatre and was fortunate to win. And then suddenly was at 25, was launched into this world of artists and makers and, and possibilities. So, um, so that's my career into the arts has been windy and and all sorts of things um, have happened and I don't doubt will continue to happen but that, that's how I got here. I think that's great that really sums up the windy path that everyone seems to have um, taken to get to where they are today so um, we're going to dive into this a little bit deeper and I'm going to ask Naomi a couple of questions. So you're not an artist we were talking about that earlier um, do you see a lot of, but you're working in the gallery sector, do you see a lot of pathways to working in the gallery sector? Yeah. And absolutely. what advice would you give to aspiring um, people who want to get into that yep. sector? Um, absolutely. So um, there's many different avenues that you can go down. Um, for me, I'm in collection management, so it's very administration heavy, a lot of data capturing and researching and um, object handling and all that sort of thing. Um, but there's exhibition design, um, elements of architecture. If you're passionate about architecture or interior design, you can also go down that path. Um, curation is very research heavy. So if you're into researching and um, curating shows and things like that. Um, even if you're into IT, you know, most institutions have massive databases. Um, I'm a bit of a database nerd. We just got a brand new one, so I'm really excited about that. But, you know, even if you're into IT, um, but you're also passionate about art and interested in that as well, um, even little avenues like that, you can get into the industry. Um, in terms of advice, um, <sighs> Definitely networking is a big one. Um, I think coming to events like this um, and looking on, you know, like Museums Australia website and all of that, they run workshops and different things. Um, attending things like that is always really good and getting to know people and expanding your networks because um, if there's always someone with a project that you could be involved in or know someone who, you know, can connect you onto the next person. Um, it, it, certainly if you're beginning like coming out of uni and looking for a job what helped me was um, even just researching different jobs I'd go on job websites almost every day and even though I wasn't quite qualified or ready for them yet um, it gave me a really good understanding of what the in industry expectations were what experience they were looking for um, all that sort of thing Dif different avenues as well there was jobs that I didn't even know existed um, in the industry so um, yeah, that's a big one. And if certainly if you're at uni, engage with your lecturers. Their networks are always huge. Um, that's how I ended up doing my honours based on a museum project um, because my supervisor used to work at Queensland Museum, so she knew who to contact and um, there I had this amazing project. So, yeah. So now you're in this job working for the Toowoomba Regional Art Gallery. Was that the job? Was that what you were always planning to do or, you know, how did you end up at the gallery? Um, it, it pretty much the job I was hoping to get. Um, I, I just knew I wanted to get into the industry, into museums or art galleries. Um, collection management um, was a bit of a surprise. Like I, I sort of thought I wanted to go more down the curation um, avenue, but having done the, um, I've been working at council for about 10 years before I, well, sorry, about six years before I got the job at the gallery. Um, but through that, I was working in the libraries. And so that's how I was able to work on those couple of collection management um, projects. So yeah, that got me interested in. I, so that was your pathway, wasn't, it was working for council and then getting yeah. all those other skills and then getting the, the yep, pathway into that's the, right. Yeah. So um, yeah, getting a feel for um, collection management I really just enjoyed it and I thought this is the avenue that I want to pursue more. So, and then the opportunity came up at the gallery. Um, yeah. 
So, so not wanting you to leave the Toowoomba Regional Art Gallery, but just wondering where would you like to, for your career to go in the future? Um, yeah, I'm pretty. I'm still interested in this in collection management, and I've still got a lot to learn. I'm really only very in early stages of my career, so um, I'm really keen to see where that takes me. I've I'm also really interested in exhibition design and um, curation as well. So I'm hoping that I can expand into that one day. Um, TRAG's really good because it's really small. So we have a small team. We all have to do bits of each other's jobs. So I already get to do a lot of um, historical research, which is right up my alley, um, but also curation, installing, um, touring. We're often in a truck delivering crates to a school or um, up a scissor lift um, as well as sitting at a desk so it's um, yeah it's really good but for the time being I'm happy exploring that but yeah if I can get into exhibitions and curating a bit more would be nice. Yeah. So even though you're um, you know you've got a certain amount of admin you, you what what do you think of the benefits of working in a cultural institution? Um, I love it's a very passion driven in, industry um, so my the people I work with are all like we're all there because we love it um so it's even on a bad day you still feel like it's where you want to be um you see I see a lot of um I love seeing the inspiration that people have after being in the gallery I've seen people um begin journeys of healing after seeing an artwork and I've had some really amazing conversations with people from five years old up to you know 90 years old from a piece of artwork that they've seen um, and I, I really love that. That's why we do what we do. Um, so, um, yeah. So you'd recommend this as a pathway for aspiring? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yep. Parents? Yep, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Rightio. So our next question is for Ari, Hello. which makes it easy. Um, so what was the, um, the key personal trait or learning that helped you get into the position you are in today? Were you mentored, mentored by anybody yeah, yeah. or inspired to pursue this path? So you were mentioning your school teacher helped yes, in that absolutely. regards. Yes, mm. um, Yeah, I think mentors have been like a key part of my journey uh, and actually for lots of people's journeys, like find the people who uh, call you out on your BS and do, who keep you accountable and who can uh, like – continue to inspire you and remind you of like why you're here and why you show up each day. Um, yeah, uh, moving into university times, uh, Associate Professor Janet McDonald has been like a massive beacon in my life and her work in uh, her academics in masculinity studies and then performance studies and community has really just kind of solidified this lens that I get to now wield myself and discover the world through that lens and then what parts of that are starting to kind of form my own um, and now being a person of color with heritage from uh, people displaced communities and the conversation around that here in this country on this land at this time is important so I'm finding what that means in a new way what does that lens look like with my brown skin, with my privileges and my placement. What, what does that mean for me to be able to work in a place called the Empire Theatre and be regional in a time that funding is becoming decentralised? And, you know, uh, there's lots of these kind of intersections of uh, mentorship that have, like, truly inspired me. And uh, going back to the, was it a personality trait? I think if you ask me, I have a cynical answer of now 15 years into the future, uh, but then I think the answer back then is listening and being able to uh, listen to uh, the, the spaces in between. And I think a lot of my work has been about filling the, the space between different parts of the landscape and being able to be like, oh, there's a gap inside of this conversation about like recently uh, the treaty with Antarctica <laughs> and uh, how science communication is happening and what can the cultural landscape learn from those things. Being able to sit inside of that space and see what we can develop um, is really like about listening. My answer uh, now 
is um, don't take yourself too seriously. I think for a lot of my kind of emerging practice, everything was very desperate and serious. And yes, there is an absolutely a time for desperate and serious. But being able to mix that with a bit of silliness and being like, I'm just a dude <laughs> is really important. So yeah, taking the glitz and glamour off it and being like, ah, that's actually what the thing is. I don't know if I've answered any of your questions. In it only the way that Ari can answer questions. <laughs> um, so as a director, would you recommend a career in the arts to young people? And what steps would you recommend that they take um, to get into the theatre, directing, acting? What, what do they need to do? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Go into the arts. The arts is ultra important in so many different conversations uh, that are happening right now. Uh, politically, uh, climately, if that's even a word, uh, for multilateral conversations that we are having inside of this country and soft power is a culture uh, kind of landscape. We have far more sway in what we make and do than we give value to. Uh, and I think we need to be um, responsible and responsive to the communication that we are sending out with our art and ourselves and our presence. Um, so yes, go into the arts. Uh, how to do that? Do so many different things that are not expected of what your form is and learn so bloody much uh, uh, I mean, as a director, knowing how to uh, work with sound, knowing how to build, there's this thing called QLab, which magically runs everything. Uh, and you don't know about that until you are actually practicing. And just knowing how to build those things is so important. Um, I, I mean, I was making pizza as my uh, like um, casual job back in the day. And even though I wasn't a practicing artist during that time, it was about working with people and uh, showing up and doing the thing, jumping through the hoops and being able to deliver. So, yeah, I don't know. I did lots of different jobs, but they all somehow kind of lent to what I'm doing right now. And, and it's got a, you know, making sure that you're doing something that you're actually passionate about makes yeah. it a lot easier as a process as well. Yeah, getting um, paid for something that you love doing. That's, wow. it's aces. that's awesome. <laughs> that's it. Um, so as, as us, us very responsible adults, how do we support our young people to, to take these difficult um, pathways? Or unfortunately, in my experience, we've also got parents that are not encouraging our children to take up the arts as a career path. How, how do we then as an in industry or as a community arts organisations or as an artist or a mentor, how do we, how do we help support those young people um, to follow their passion and to follow that, that creative course? Yeah, I think the first thing is to recognise that the entryways and pathways for these folks now are completely different from what they were for me completely different what they were for my parents. They, they are dealing with a different landscape than what we were. And inside of that, they have to find agency and ownership inside of that journey. So I think supporting uh, young creatives in uh, just kind of opening up what we do. I, I think it's very bizarre that we don't let young people sit on our boards, that we don't consult with them when it comes to um, things that desperately affect them. Why aren't we talking to them about funding? Uh, things like that. Yes, there might be a perceived lack of experience, but there's an experience that we don't have access to because they live their lives right here, right now in a way that we don't. So I think what we can do as organisations is throw open the doors and kind of figure out who the gatekeepers are and why they're there, kind of question what that looks like and how we can remodel it. Uh, but for the young people in our lives is just give them the agency to go forth and make it their own. 
just as we kind of did in all sorts of capacities through our own separate journeys. No, all good. <laughs> See, it's all about agency. And um, the audience who are listening tonight, if um, on the live stream, if you've got any questions for our panel, feel free to um, enter them in the chat box and um, someone's going to message me and so we'll, we'll feed the questions to the um, panel as well. And same in the room here, if you've got questions, we'll actually put some hands up in a little while for questions from the audience as well. Okay, so Dr. Kyle. I almost said Dr. Kyle, but Dr. Kyle. Do you think university is the best pathway to a successful life or career in the arts? Do you think that's the way to go? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, oh, look, I, I, so I come from a DIY background. I think it's really important to understand that and to know that. Um, so DIY is you know, do it yourself. Um, so, I mean, probably following on what um, Naomi and Ari were talking about, I mean, and to, and obviously it'll answer your question. I mean, I made, it, I made a decision when I went to art school. First, I wouldn't make any artwork because there was enough crap in the world for me not to just fill it with more. Um, instead, I decided I would just do lots of reading. I worked like three bar jobs. And then at uni, I got... Because they, you know, they thought it was really interesting. I didn't want to make any art. That basically, I just wrote about other students' work, and that, and I made fanzines and catalogues and books, and that was my artwork. Um, and so, to answer your question, I mean, I, I got, I got really lucky when I was nineteen. I got invited to be a co-director of a, an artist run space in Sydney called CBD. CBD was the oldest artist-run space in Australia. It lasted for about 18, 19 years. I was not there for that long. But we used to do 52 shows a year. So wow. we'd install on a Monday, open on a Tuesday, galleries open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, deinstall Sunday, reinstall Monday, and we did it. I was there for eight years. So it's 52 artists a year. So it allowed me and enabled me to meet a lot of both younger artists that I'm still friends with today. But it also allowed me to meet a lot of senior artists and really important artists, um, internationally important artists who I've remained friends with and who are really fantastic to me because they, they just thought I was this idiot savant that was hanging around and, and so they were very kind. Um, and, but my advice to young people, and I guess this comes to university, is university is really fantastic. I mean, I loved art school. It was really, it was a lot of fun um in lots of ways that probably can't be videotaped um but it was it taught me a lot about how to organize activities for myself and that's probably the greatest piece of advice i would give to anyone especially now regardless of your age or experience is to to have this drive to just organize your own activities because i will guarantee you if you invite people to participate with you most of them will say yes because they are so desperate and not desperate out of being negative, but desperate out of the positive of just wanting to be engaged. And so that's, that was my whole background with uni was that we just, myself and a bunch of other people were just constantly running spaces or so, I mean, starting spaces, starting catalogs, just doing anything and everything um, that we could just to create these activities for ourselves. And, you know, I, I fell into academia, I fell into teaching. Um, I didn't, never chose it. Um, I was really prepared to just be a lifer and work the three bar jobs for the rest of my life and just continue on making things and contributing. And I've always said that on my deathbed, I would rather have made a contribution than have any money. Now, I know that goes against probably the whole talk, but... Um, it's, it's not saying that, you know, you should turn your back on like commercial galleries or museums or anything like that. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that instead of waiting around for those opportunities to come, create the opportunities first. And as Naomi said, you just constantly do research on other opportunities. And it's just about breathing through the, the work you make. And if mm -hmm. you can do that, it makes you a good person. 
So the focus being on making, so if you weren't able to get to the university for your marks or for your personal circumstances, finances, whatever, you don't see that as a deterrent. You sort of, you would say that it's the making that's important and well, just to expose yourself to different ideas. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're lucky to live in Australia in, in one sense because, I mean, it's really affordable education. I mean, I went to Rhode Island School of Design for a year and that was 32,000 US, but I didn't have to pay because I was an exchange student from Sydney College of the Arts. So, um, but that sort of tells you that, you know, ki kids in America who go to art school, they're not going to art school to mess around. It's a job, it's a business. And so, you know, they're going for very serious reasons. And I'm not saying students that come to Australian art schools uh, are messing around either. Um, my point is, is that it's, um, there's a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of openness in Australia. And uh, look, I have to say, probably the worst thing that's ever happened to this country was the cutting of TAFE. TAFE is the most incredible thing because in America, it's called a junior college. And TAFE was has been extraordinary, and, you know, hopefully one day it will rise, but uh, TAFE was fantastic. And I'm a huge believer in TAFE because you have this really beautiful relationship between people who can go to TAFE and learn skills and techniques, and I'm just talking about visual arts here, but who then might want to go on further, I don't know, like the Aries and Naomi's and myself, um, that it offers them those opportunities. But if they want to leave after TAFE and go and just exhibit and do other things, then they have those skills as well. So, um, all right. So Any politicians you, here? We need TAFE. What do you, what do you, um, what do you reckon are the biggest challenges for visual artists today? Um, look, I, I think the first thing, I think the biggest challenge, and especially to being in Australia, is that, like, and no disrespect to anyone that does this, but Australia normal art is like landscape painting and portraiture. That's that's our that's our that's our historical work. You know, obviously the indigenous work as well. Um, but I think unlike New Zealand, like Australia needs to engage with indigenous practices more and more. New Zealanders have done this because they understand the wealth of intellect and content that's within that genre of work, the Murray work obviously. But um, I think the hardest thing in Australia is feeling like you're isolated. But this, this, is, this is where we live in a global culture now. This is where if you set up your own program, your own project, this is where you can make a connection. Like you can live in Toowoomba and have a gallery and invite people from all around the world and, you know, they'll be engaged, they'll be interested. People, you know, there's so many people who are really interested in just wanting to engage artistically that it's, it feels like it's harder than ever, but I think it's easier than ever. Like I really do. So what, what advice would you give somebody who's interested in um, pursuing a career in visual arts? Stay in architecture. Stay no, in I'm study not. architecture. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, I would think about what it is you really love to do, like artistically, and I would start to say to myself, okay, the kind of normal or commercial um, way of doing this is this. But what are some other alternative ways that I could do it where it won't cost me money? Or what, what I would do is get together with a group of people. I would collaborate. And when you're younger, it's so much better to strengthen numbers. I know that might sound cliche, but you get like-minded people together and you can just do anything. And, and I think that's the key for me is if, you know, to get a couple of people, start some sort of project and just start making, as Ari said, start making connections with people. You start doing that, I'll tell you now, people will want to come to Toowoomba to exhibit from over the other side of the, the ditch, so to speak, the world, because it's strange. Anyone can go have a show in Sydney or Brisbane. Not everyone can have a show in Toowoomba. And that's what's interesting. That's good. Thank you. So next we will have a chat with Steve. So, Steve, how do we attract people into a career in the museums? And what is it that we need in this field as well? Who do we need working in our museums? Look, that, that's a great question. And I think listening to everyone so far, without sounding cliched, I think 
your pathways where you find it. Um, we all find our way home somehow, some way. My, my pathway started as a, um, a commercial manager, obviously running retail shops, news agencies, travel agencies, um, coffee shops and restaurants. So there was over 60 odd of those. So um, I cut my teeth on understanding business principles. And that was as a result, funnily enough, of being a ski bum in Austria. So how weird was that? Um, and as a result of that, I was um, asked to look at an opportunity in the Northern Territory where you could apply those same principles of commercial and, uh, and accountability to building airports and wharves and inland railways. But at the very heart of all of those projects and all of those things which I was involved in were people. And it wasn't the managers that made those projects work. It was the very heart of the people that contributed. And then once you understand people and that people have families and that their work rewards them and then pays their bills and puts food on the table, one gets an understanding of the, the real value of their role and what they can do. I've been fortunate working through the Murray River and free governments and um, the federal government and so forth and understanding the importance of ecology, which ultimately led to the, the biosphere, the gig. But um, again, People come to the fore, whether they were farmers, whether they were retailers, and you know what? Um, their health was all about their community. And so, you know, this, this commercial guy was starting to learn that there's more to life than a, a, a profit and loss. It was about people. And um, I spent a lot of time in Mildura. I don't know if you've been there, or, but um, I've got to say it's one of the most impressive communities where I've seen art come to the fore, where it's celebrated. And I thought, well, gee, that's, that's, it, it really affected me. And um, my time in the Murray River, funnily enough, led to the appointment with Noosa because um, we, we're very competitive in tourism. We want to be the best of the best and um, we want to celebrate the best of the best. So um, sadly, when the Murray River put its hand up to combat this little place called Noosa, we ran second. But um, that night, the chairman came over and introduced himself and said, we'd like to have a chat because you're talking our language. And it was about community, the commonwealth of that community, the welfare of those people. And anyone who's obviously visited Noosa knows that those are the attributes of that community. It's, it's got a population cap of about 48,000. It really values the, the community in its entirety there. But also, um, apart from the pillars of a surf beach, food and wine, I can promise you with hand on heart that the art sector is alive and growing and it was a, a real eye opener for me in terms of the value of arts to the community. So that was the, the, the confirmation that art community, they're linked. And if you link that to environment, um, the health of the Murray River, et cetera, um, gee, we've all got a responsibility to contribute to that and bring our own specialist and expertise to the fore. So hopefully, and uh, as I said, I'm the odd man out here, but um, my contribution is hopefully helping artisans with money, access to money, food on the table, um, and hopefully have a very deep appreciation of what they produce as a result. So yeah, there's that. Um, you don't necessarily need to have that that arts background, but you've got to have that skill set to be able to develop and work with others, um, which is that collaborative approach that we're always looking for. And obviously, with the Cobb and Co Museum too, you're telling stories. You're telling stories about people and about the history and about the current. Um, community also. Um, so if we had a young person that was interested in, 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 you know, pursuing a museum career outside of that conservation or um, collection management, which is one of my favourite words, um, you know, how else, how else can a young person get engaged with our museums and, and forge a career in our museum networks? That's, that's very, very simple. We in the Queensland Museum Network celebrate lifelong learning. At the very heart of lifelong learning is a shared safe space to come together and celebrate that. So lifelong learning doesn't necessarily start in a museum. It starts at home, it starts with mum and dad. It starts with them recognising what is important to you as an individual and then nurturing that growth. Um, I remember field trips with my parents um, obviously being casino of North Coast, a lot of beach and rivers, but um, every opportunity, it was this small, small 
country town called Brisbane, lots of one-way streets and so forth, but um, there was always art galleries and museums and so forth. So that nurture starts young. That first hug with history could even start with the Horrible Histories TV show. But parents have to recognise if that's their journey, that's what they've got to embrace and support. So in the museum, we do really support the concept and principles of lifelong learning. We have a, a program called Little Covers, and we're very fortunate. One of my colleagues is here tonight who's running that at the moment. And um, I've got to say, it's one of the best things we do, inviting three, four, five and six year olds to, into the museum to start that journey of in, uh, asking the questions about age, sharing stories. That journey of learning continues into their teenagers and, and the middle ages. But from a, a museum perspective, we don't want it to stop there. And um, at Cobb Co, we've created a thing called Reminiscence. And that's where if you can't come to the museum, we'll take the museum to you. So every fortnight, we've got the, the best group of 68 volunteers that come together and bring objects from our collection and then take it out to the various aged care facilities. So that lifelong learning starts very young and it finishes very, very late. And uh, so that's what we contribute to learning as a pathway. Um, if you look at the more traditional sense, which we've spoken about earlier through, I think you said universities. You know, you've really got to have a look at the changing way of the the environment of the community, the economy, and 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 you perhaps even question the value of a degree. Um, and I pose this, you know, as a, a little bit of a question to look at both sides of that coin. Um, the government recently, as a result of the pandemic and the, the freeze, has instituted an employment freeze across state government institutions. So you would think any opportunities that come along and someone who puts their hands up and says, guess what, I've got a degree in X, Y, Z, I'm going to jump to the front of the queue. And hopefully that's the case. But what I can also say on the other side of that coin is that's not always the case. So my advice is in terms of looking for opportunity, diversify yourself. Don't close your eyes to things like the, the dark science of commerce because it's the thing that's going to pay the bill. And if you can have some appreciation of that, I think you'll go a long way to sustaining and helping the people sustain the entity that, that you want to be a part of. Thank you. So we might go to Claire. Claire, um, you, well, you've described your pathway to, to being a writer. What, what do you reckon um, would you... What would you say was the best way for an emerging writer to get out there and start their career? I think um, there is no best way. I think, or, or there's no single way um, for emerging writers to have a have a career in this in this country or or in the world. Um, my kind of career has come from different opportunities leading to different opportunities giving me confidence to do um, other things. So, for example, I was a playwright and felt very kind of comfortable in that space after years of building work and making independent theatre and working at the Empire Theatre for three and a half years. Um, and then when I felt comfortable in that, I decided I wanted to write a novel and put that novel into a competition. So I think the advice is... Um, you will make your own path. If you want to write, then write and do the research of what competitions are around, what emerging writers' festivals are around. Um, there are what, what short story compilations can you contribute to or, or what emerging um, writer prizes are they? Most publishers have, uh, have emerging writer. They're looking for new manuscripts. They're looking for content. Um, so I think my advice is if you want to be a writer, then you need to put your bum in the chair and write. That's the first step. Um, and then you also need to um, do the research of what is happening, what can you contribute to, what can you, what opportunities can you uh, put your work into. That's probably, that's the, that's the pathway. What about critical friends? Do you think you need? Uh, how do you how do you bounce 
you know, do you bounce ideas around with people or is it something that you sort of nurture, you know, quietly to yourself or do you, do you have to have mentors or what, what, what helps to hone your, your skills and, and your practice, do you think? I think, I think absolutely having um, a group of creatives that you um, connect with or that you trust. My advice when I'm working with young people, particularly young writers, is always to be really specific about the feedback that you want to receive um, because I think a lot of amazing creators um, stop creating because they got advice or they got feedback that, that injured um, their craft too early on. And so that play or that novel or whatever it was got put in the drawer and, um, and didn't get touched again. So that's normally my advice is to be really specific. Is this funny? Did this character um, make you cry? What were the things in this that didn't make sense? Whatever it is that you are curious about and give those questions to someone you trust. That way people can read um, your work through that lens. If you want, um, if you just want some praise or someone to tell you it's great, then give it to someone who loves you and is obligated to tell you it's amazing. Um, I think is, <laughs> is, is the way to go. Um, with writing, it's, I've found amazing community through uh, online and through Twitter and Instagram. So writing YA uh, or young adult fiction, there's an incredible young adult fiction um, community in Australia of bloggers and readers and writers, uh, which is amazing. And then having just written um, adult fiction and a contemporary romance, the bloggers and other authors that I am meeting all online, uh, uh, it's, it's incredible. So I'm learning about other opportunities or things through, through meeting other people. But find your, find your people, connect with them. I'm very grateful that Ari is one of my people. Um, and we bounce ideas and uh, lots of terrible ideas, lots of great ideas of each other all the time. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. I, I think that's really interesting that um, what you said about, um, you know, finding people that you trust or, the, or asking specific questions, because as creatives, we can tend to have thin skins. And so I guess that's part of this discussion is for those creatives who are thinking about, you know, am I good enough? You know, should I do this? All those questions. Um, I'll start with you, Claire. What would you, what would you, um, you know, what attributes do you need to have as a creative, do you think, in order to, to have the 83 rejection um, letters from the publishers or, or not get that audition or, you know, not be confident to get that job? What do you think? I think being a creative, and this is, this is for anyone, this is if you creatively wash your car, if you, uh, the way you cook pasta is creative. I think everyone is inherently creative. Um, it's just about how you are creative. But I think doing anything creatively requires vulnerability. That's my dog. I'm so sorry. Uh, Midge, I mentioned her in the bio. Um, I think doing anything creatively requires vulnerability and we're not good at vulnerability. Um, so it's about learning how to back yourself. Um, it's about learning how to be your best advocate. It's about... Um, Speaking for yourself like Mitch is right now, thinking about what your needs are. Um, yeah, I think it, it does require a confidence in your own work and why, in the why you are making it. I think if you constantly come back to that, it will make every rejection worth it or more manageable. I think that's very good advice. And um, we've only got a few more minutes before we wrap up. So I thought I just might see if anybody on the floor has got some questions for the panel. Before I dive into some more, um, yeah, life skills for creatives. Ari, what would you suggest? What would you tell people to put in their kit bag? Oh, um, know when to shut up, <laughs> <laughs> and and know when to take conversations offline, and be like, you know what? Maybe we we definitely have to talk about this, but not right now in front of everyone. Like, I think that's 
as part of backing yourself, uh, as Claire was saying, is also knowing like what sway you have with people and when to do that. So I think that's a really important thing. And, and uh, the flip of this coin as well is not just the responsibility on people entering into uh, these landscapes and industries, but also on service providers and training institutions. We have had lots of terrible ways of training creative people where um, those injuries that Claire was talking about are, are wounds that are taken all the way into the future. And how do we actually create those safe spaces that hold people's resilience and like empowers resilience inside of that? We need to be able to have artists that bounce back and are responsive and then responsible inside of it. And I'll shut up now. Um, so, all right. So, you know, you're an aspiring artist, uh, maker, uh, curator, whatever. Where, where would you recommend people get help in their career options? Where should they go? Uh, I'll do it. Um, I guess it depends on what, what field you're in. But, I mean, what I would do is to start to look at the community that you want to be engaged in and start... Um, spending time with that community, start ingratiating yourself to the people in that community. I mean, uh, look, I think the first thing is that um, there's no such thing as failure. You know, don't be scared of failure because I think the thing with making anything or doing anything creative is the first thing I would say to someone is um, it's not about you want to do it, it's that you need to do it because it's about you. It's about fulfilling something in you that no other activity can fulfill in you. And that can be a, quite an abstract idea. But I think having that, as Ari had said, um, resilience. Um, I mean, I've, look, I've been really fortunate because, as I said, I've been mentored by a lot of artists and also I don't really care what anyone thinks. And I'm serious about that. Like, I don't care what people think about me or the work because I just need to do it. But that also opens up the idea that I'm also open to what people think because I'm not one of these people that if you don't understand what I'm making, it means you're obsolete. And I think that's the other thing of being just open to people in general, being open to the idea that people, when they look at art in any way, bring their own experiences and their own wants and their own interests to it. And I think acknowledging that those interests and wants and desires are valuable. I think as a community in Australia, we don't value enough, you know, we're isolationists and we tend to devalue things. And I think for me, if I was a young artist again, um, and I think these guys have said it, I, I think there's no, don't be scared of the commercial aspects and don't be scared of the DIY aspects. It's just all open space that, you know, you can work your way through and do really interesting things in and, I think that's the key. Just don't be scared of failure. I mean, there is no such thing as failure as far as I'm concerned. The only failure is not doing it. I like that. The only failure is not doing it, not living up to your own creative spirit. Mm. We have a question from the audience. Um, my I might paraphrase you for our online audience. 
um, Neil raised the question of um, the focus being on young people, but what about emerging artists who are not under 35 and what might, what um, pathways might there be for them? Um, Claire, what would you, what advice would you have in terms of the gallery sector and, and Ari or anybody for that matter? Yeah. 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 Um, I think you're right. I think that does exist. I think it's we're getting we are getting there. I think I think that thinking is moving. Um, certainly, like I know a lot of the programs that we do at the gallery. Um, I can't speak for other galleries, um, but there's no age limit. It's you're emerging. If you're emerging, you're emerging. It doesn't matter what age you are. Um, you could be 80 <laughs> and be an emerging artist. Um, so I certainly think that all um, programs targeted at emerging artists shouldn't have an age limit, um, it, not just for artists, you know, for anything, because we're in, we're in an age now where you don't do the same job that, you you know, for 50 years, you don't start a job and then that's the job you retire from. Like young people, well, all people at the moment are staying in jobs for five to 10 years and then they change. So um I, I can certainly see in the things that I've um, dealt with in the gallery um, that, that we are moving away from that thinking. Um, I, yeah, I don't, what was I going to say? Um, I've lost my train of thought. I, th I think <laughs> it's, it's a good, I think it's a good question and yeah. I think it's probably a good time to end the discussion here, but after, for those people who are actually in the venue, we're going to be having a speed dating in the art session after this, which is your opportunity to speak to any of us about any questions you might have. And it'll be a 10 minute session. But you know, out of that, think about the questions that you might have. Um, and we can answer any, we'll try to answer those questions for you. Yeah. Oh, I think what I was, sorry, it's really quick. What I was going to say, I just remembered, um, is I like wouldn't think about what age you are. It's just take the same opportunities that are there for young people you know anyone can enroll in uni anyone can apply for this that and the other like just the same opportunities that we've all discussed just go for it like that's yeah that's what I was gonna say sorry that's great so um that ends our, our online portion for this evening so I'd like to thank all of our our panel members who are here and who are online as well thank you Claire for your time thanks um, so much. So our, um, our, if you could all um, give them a quick round of applause, I think, for the great job that they've done this evening and for, for joining us. Um, so don't forget, too, next month we have another Arts Dinner live and online. Um, it will be hosted down in the Cynic Rim at Tambourine Mountain. Um, and we will be looking at the cultural champions from across southwest Queensland. Um, it's on Tuesday, the 8th of December. So keep that in mind, but you'll be getting an email anyway. Um, thank you, everybody online for, for coming along tonight and, and um, listening in on this conversation. And um, this will also be available through the Arts Front a website as a um, as a recording also if you wanted to go back and 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 have another have another listen thank you very much everybody um, so that should should take us to the end of um, our online recording